Hello, my name is Yongjun Len. I am a physical oceanographer at the School of Ocean Sciences at Bangor University and the principal investigator for the Changing Arctic Oceans Peanuts project. So you've probably heard um, how the Arctic has been known to be greening. Well, actually something similar is happening in the oceans. You can see that the areas from turquoise to red are the areas in which both satellite observations as well as numerical models are predicting we're going to have big increases of photosynthesizing phytoplankton in the surface oceans in the future. So is Arctic primary productivity driven by escalating Arctic nutrient fluxes? And to answer this question, we set out to measure ocean mixing, which draws deep nutrients to the surface. And the reason mixing may have an impact on nutrient fluxes is if we take a cross section of the ocean, and this is a picture of our layered Arctic Ocean, in which you have different layers of water, such as warm, salty Atlantic origin flowing water, as well as Pacific origin water, also warm, flowing on the western side into the Arctic Ocean, and they sit at different levels depending on their density. However, Primary production only takes place in the surface ocean where the sunlight is able to be present for the photosynthesizing phytoplankton. Once that nutrient supply in the surface layer is depleted, in order to keep a bloom going, you need to provide extra nutrients from below, from the deeper layers of the Arctic Ocean, which is why we were interested in measuring ocean mixing. Um, you can see that as Atlantic water flows into the Arctic, it kind of follows the red pathways that I've drawn on the map to the left. And as it flows into the Barents Sea, you can see its temperature has been increasing over the last 40 or so years that we've been measuring the temperature of Atlantic water. And its impact is that this blue line in the middle panel shows you the average latitude of sea ice in the Barents Sea and in the winter the sea ice extends to the south and retreats to the north in the summer. So this jagged zigzag pattern shows you these annual cycles in sea ice and you can see that after about 2005 we've really had a receding of that sea ice even in winter. And as you go further along the pathway of the Atlantic water in the Arctic Ocean, further into the Eastern Arctic, you can see this blue line in the top panel shows you the depth of the top of the Atlantic water. And you can see it's also got shallower and shallower over time. All this has combined to a process known as Atlantification of the Eastern Arctic, in which we find the properties of Atlantic water, which are warm and salty, being more evident at the surface in the Arctic Ocean, which implies that the nutrients have also been drawn up together with its heat. And we have made new measurements of new mixing mechanisms that we've not seen before in the Arctic. Um, there's a lot of detail on this slide, don't worry about it, just understand that in the grey areas what we're showing you is that we've measured fast currents that seem to be associated with a breaking wave, a breaking internal wave that is propagating along the interfaces of these different layers in the Arctic. And that has broken and driven nutrient fluxes up to the surface. And all of it is driven by winds, which are able to put more and more energy into the Arctic as the ice, ice goes away. You can see the Pacific water entering through the Bering Strait entering the central Arctic Ocean. And as it does so, it jumps down below that cold, flesh, fresh layer. In the plume are nutrients and also phytoplankton that have already been present and grown before. As this plume subducts, it draws more mixing, drawing up nutrients from below the plume and driving up into the surface ocean above. As you can see, the plume kind of eventually becomes these big eddies that carry all that heat with them into the central Arctic Ocean. And they are likely contributing to accelerating the sea ice melt there. So what we can see here 
in this graph is that the red shaded red peaks show you when nutrient fluxes from below are being pumped up into the surface ocean. And at the beginning of this record, which is kind of early summer, June, July, we don't need those nutrient fluxes to drive the blooms, which are shown in green. But as summer progresses, those nutrient fluxes are resulting in big peaks in primary productivity following the injection of nutrients into the surface ocean. So we do think as a result that the answer to the central question of peanuts is ocean mixing driving nutrient fluxes that support primary production. The answer to that is yes. The other conclusions from our result that are important for um, all of us are really thinking about how that heat from the Atlantic and Pacific waters are reaching the surface ocean and the impact they are having on the sea ice. Arctic sea ice is particularly important because it reflects a lot of solar radiation out into space. The other consequence of losing sea ice, when they have low summer sea ice, these low summer sea ice years have been linked to harsh winters in the following winter season across Europe and Asia. And one last um, consequence of low sea ice that I'd like to highlight today is that low sea ice means more sunlight reaching the surface ocean. And the question of what this sunlight is doing and the consequences of that are going to be discussed now by my colleague Finlow Cotier. Hello, I'm Finlow Cotier. I'm a professor in polar oceanography at the Scottish Association for Marine Science. I think that the continuing loss of sea ice is one of the most graphic consequences of climate disruption in the Arctic. And we've heard that heat and fresh water are critical parameters, but the sea ice acts as a huge sunshade and loss of sea ice allows more light to enter the ocean. When you look at the ice-free Arctic Ocean, the water appears very black, so you might think it's a dark ocean. But actually, as sea ice continues to be lost from all areas in the Arctic at all times of year, the Arctic Ocean is becoming more illuminated. There is more light entering the ocean, and this inevitably has biological impacts. Light was central to a number of projects in the Changing Arctic Ocean program. And one project that I led investigated the biological response to seasonally varying light and seasonally varying sea ice cover. The project was called Arctic Productivity in the Seasonal Ice Zone. And we don't mean productivity in the economic sense, but in the sense of a productive ocean, where the basic plant life in the ocean, the phytoplankton, take in carbon through a process called photosynthesis. The carbon is stored in the phytoplankton and transferred to other life forms, such as tiny animals called zooplankton, which then become the prey for economically and culturally significant species of fish and mammals. A key question for us was, what role does light play in different seasons? In our project, we used robotic gliders, these are autonomous uh, vehicles that travel backwards and forwards through the ocean, rising and falling from the seabed to the surface, collecting data along that pathway. And from these measurements, we made two important scientific discoveries. The first relates to the timing of critical biological parameters, most notably the rapid growth of phytoplankton in spring called the spring bloom. And to be able to measure um, this and to simulate it we need very accurate models of the light in the ocean and our project was able to use the glider data to create a new computer simulation of light in the ocean and the model can start now to answer questions about whether blooms will begin earlier in the year will they last longer and where will they occur and the second discovery relating to light was about the response of animals to illumination Zooplankton are tiny animals which eat and graze on the phytoplankton, which grows in the illuminated surface. But then the zooplankton have a daily trade-off to make. How much time do they spend in the surface eating? But if they spend too much time there, they're at risk of being eaten themselves by other animals in the food chain, notably fish. And the solution is to move vertically every day through the water, migrating between the dark depths of the ocean and the illuminated surface. And our project discovered that some of the behavioural characteristics of zooplankton include seeking out darkness with safety from predators. And they do this in a very consistent way year round. And this understanding allows us to uh, represent zooplankton in ecosystem simulations more accurately. 
So through our project, we now have a way of simulating light levels in the ocean, which leads to the phytoplankton blooms. And we have a way of simulating the behavior of zooplankton, which transfers the carbon from the phytoplankton into different parts of the food chain. The loss of ice for Arctic communities has lots of aspects to it. As well as a platform for travel and hunting, the loss of the shading that's provided by ice will change the relationship between marine predators and their prey. And the local food webs will inevitably respond and historically robust food resources could be in jeopardy. And carbon flow is not just confined to the Arctic. The contribution of the Arctic to the capture, flow, burial and release of carbon in the global system is really important. But do we really understand how the Arctic will function if we continue along this path towards an ice-free summer? I don't believe we do. Uh, and yet that's the trajectory that we're on. Uh, we have a globally important ocean with significant harvestable resources that's becoming more illuminated. And this is going to undermine the stability and resilience of the Arctic marine ecosystem. Communities and cultures are reliant on the productive Arctic Ocean, so we must act in their interests. So hopefully I've shown that light is fundamental to the productivity of the Arctic Ocean. That productivity is fueled by carbon, and ultimately, much of that carbon will make its way from the illuminated ocean surface down to the sea floor. Well, thanks very much, Finlo. Um, so my name is Christian Mertz. I'm a, a biogeochemist from the University of Leeds, and uh, I'm also the principal investigator on the Changing Arctic Ocean project. We um, studied specifically uh, the sea floor of the Arctic Ocean and how it would respond to ongoing climate changes. Um, one thing that many people don't realize is that the sea floor is still a very active ecosystem and it is a very important hub for the cycling of carbon and other nutrients in a way very similar to your compost heap in the garden. So the seafloor receives organic material that sinks down from the water column like you are basically shoveling kitchen waste onto your compost heap and then there is a, a myriad of microbes and also little worms and other critters that dig through that material and release certain nutrients, which is what you want from your, for your plants, but a certain amount of the organic matter, uh, which is mainly carbon, is also then remaining in your compost heap. And these are all the factors that also impact what happens at the seafloor. So the first thing I wanted to show you is a video um, of the box corer that is deployed to the seafloor. It's then being pulled up and you can see it coming down to the deck of our research ship here, the James Clark Ross. And uh, yeah, you can see as it's being lifted, there's a gush of water and then you have a nice block of intact seafloor in front of you. This mud is then uh, sorted and sieved for all the little critters and animals that live there. And that gives us a picture of uh, the seafloor ecosystem. Another tool we use, and you can see it going into the water here is the so-called multicorer, which has a number of tubes that go into the seafloor, as you can see here. It's an instrument that um, really preserves the boundary between the seawater and the sediment, which is what we need for some of our research. So what we found in terms of benthic ecosystems is there is a very clear divide between the northern and the southern Barents Sea, which is basically imprinted by two different water masses sitting above the seafloor. So there's a very clear connection um, between what happens in the overlying water and what happens at the seafloor. And um, this uh, boundary between these two water masses, the so-called polar front, is bound to shift further north. And we've already seen that over the last decades. And it affects in a very similar way the seafloor ecosystems and biodiversity, obviously. Now, another thing that is very important is the nutrients that are being released from the seafloor and the carbon that is being stored in there. Because on the one hand, the seafloor fertilizes the overlying water column. On the other hand, it is also a very important pool to store carbon that was previously sequestered by algae in the water column, then sank down to the seafloor and is now buried into the seafloor over thousands of years, as we could show. So it really sits around there and, um, and has removed permanently almost CO2 from the atmosphere. 
Now, one thing we looked at most recently is the effects of increasing bottom trawling on, on all of these things. Um, as sea ice is retreating, especially from the shallower parts of the Arctic Ocean, there's much more sh fishing and trawling activity in previously pristine areas. And that really disrupts uh, the entire ecosystems and also these carbon and nutrient cycles. And what we could definitely uh, see and predict is depending on how deep the trawling is and what kind of instruments you're using, you're strongly reducing the capacity of the seafloor to hold carbon that was previously buried there. It's like when you're digging through your compost heap, you're exposing the organic material to oxygen, it gets degraded. That's the same thing that happens in, this, in the Arctic Ocean. You are re-oxidizing this carbon to CO2 that goes back into the atmosphere. Um, on the other hand, you might increase at least on the short term, um, the fertilization effect, because you have nutrients stored within the sediments, you're flushing them up through the trawling back into the water, and there they could fertilize new primary productivity and algal growth. It's still quite unknown how these processes will pan out in the future, because it's something that we're really just starting to study as the environment is changing. So in a way, we are almost uh, trying to play catch up with how quickly the system is changing and how quickly we can study it. Hello, my name is Claire Mahaffey. I'm a professor of ocean sciences at the University of Liverpool, and I'm the principal investigator of the ARISE project. So the Arctic Ocean is rich in life from the remarkable microscopic plankton that live in sea and ice, right up to the whales, seals and polar bears. Together, they make up the unique Arctic ecosystem, which supports 4 million people that live in the Arctic. So the goal of the ARISE project was to assess the impact of climate change on Arctic marine ecosystems, and also to attribute ecosystem change to drivers. ARISE focused on a specific property of an ecosystem known as a food chain, which simply describes the dependence of one organism on another as a food source. Using naturally occurring stable nitrogen isotopes, written here as 15N, we were able to quantify the variation of nitrogen isotopes in plankton at the base of the food chain and in seals. So trends in um, nitrogen isotopes in plankton reflect multiple drivers of environmental change, whereas estimating food chain length and trophic position of seals provides information on food web dynamics both in space and in time. However, our planet has been warming for decades, and so we can learn a lot from looking at how marine ecosystems have changed in the past in response to our changing climate. So through international collaborations, we gained access to archives of seal tissues going back to the 1950s. So just as you can reconstruct the age of a tree using the rings in the tree, you can also reconstruct past trends and ecosystem dynamics by analysing the stable nitrogen isotopes in seal teeth and in seal tissue. So using this novel information alongside new knowledge on the historical seal migrations from seal tags, as well as in, um, output from global numerical models, the ARISE project developed a really novel framework to assess change in Arctic ecosystems, but importantly over decadal timescales and also at pan-Arctic spatial scales. So we used decadal trends in nitrogen isotopes and plankton to assess environmental change. In the Canadian Arctic, we observed an increase in nitrogen isotopes and plankton. And in contrast, in the Barents Sea, we observed a decreasing trend in nitrogen isotopes and plankton, both of these trends over decadal timescales. So using a global numerical model, we reconstructed past trends in isotopes and plankton, but importantly, we identified the drivers of change and also were able to then make future project, uh, projections. So natural variability dominates the simulation initially, but in agreement with our observations, there's an increasing uh, trend in isotopes and plankton in the Canadian Arctic and a decreasing trend in the Barents Sea. So sea ice loss, as well as increased primary productivity, explain the increasing trend in nitrogen isotopes and plankton in the Pacific-influenced Arctic, so the Canadian Arctic, 
whereas increased Atlantic inflow explains the decreasing trend in the Barents Sea region, that is the Atlantic-influenced Arctic. So what about the seals? So in the Canadian Arctic, since the 1990s, the trophic position of ring seals decreased in the high Arctic, but remained constant in the mid-Arctic. If we contrast that to what we observe in the Barents Sea and the Labrador Sea, the trends in the, ice, in the trophic position in harp seals was actually non-linear in both regions. So why is this? So for ring seals living in the Canadian Arctic, and especially in the high Arctic, it's the decline in sea ice and increase in open water days which has altered the feeding dynamics of ice-dependent zooplankton. This has shortened the food chain, driving a decline in the trophic position of ring seals. However, in the mid-Arctic, these changes to the environment have already taken place pre-1990s due to being at a lower latitude, and therefore we see no change in the trophic position of ring seals. In the Barents Sea, the non-linear decadal variation in the trophic position of harp seals may actually be linked to fish stocks, in this case capelin, with high capelin abundance driving a decline in the trophic position. So using a combination of observations, seal telemetry and global models, ARISE has provided really robust scientific evidence for decadal scale changes in the Arctic ecosystem. Our panoptic approach, however, has demonstrated that these changes in the ecosystem are non-uniform and instead vary between regions. We were also able to attribute the observed changes to both local and far field drivers but again, these drivers vary quite significantly. In some regions, it's due to uh, the drivers are melting ice and productivity. And in some regions, it's due to the influence of the connected oceans, that is the Atlantic and the Pacific. So the Arctic ecosystem has been responding to climate change for decades, many decades, and will continue to do so. New knowledge that we get from archives alongside local indigenous communities is vital to support our short-term science-based understanding of change. So understanding the non-uniform regional response and drivers of change is vital both for Arctic communities and also management of these natural resources into the future. Thank you for listening. Hi, my name is Jens Strauss from the Alfred Wegener Institute in Potsdam in Germany. I am a geoecologist working on frozen ground, which is called permafrost. Together with my colleague Paul Mann from Newcastle, I am leading the project Cocoon. With this team, we are working on the changing Arctic carbon cycle, and especially with a focus on the coastal nearshore zone. This project we are working on together is about permafrost, frozen ground, which is getting non-permanent with warming Arctic regions. Actually, this is the main challenge here for, for all these carbon and sediments and ice which is in there and now getting remobilized with warming. We are looking at how much of this carbon could be mobilized and put or uh, transported into the rivers in, uh, in Russia and how this uh, is connected to the Arctic Ocean. With this huge amounts of sediments, ice and carbon eroding there, we found up to 20 meters we have an increase of this erosion and transportation in the last decades. This eroded ancient carbon is partially of very good quality, at least from the microbial point of view, though so they can use that to produce greenhouse gases. With this carbon in the water, there is breakdown, then even this breakdown here is enhancing or speeding up processes going on in the water. This has great implications for the ecosystem processes like greenhouse gas productions are increasing. Uh, also, we included uh, a process which is called thermocast. Thermocast is a deep thawing uh, process which can like even more remobilize carbon which was frozen in on land. Up to three or 12 times more carbon we found to be prone to thaw in the future. In the future means 300 years in our case. Paired this with enhanced runoff, this means that more water is flushing down the river by more rain and snow input, we will have fuel greater greenhouse gas emissions from Arctic catchments. 
A recent modeling approach, we were using a biogeochemical model and identified the bioreactivity of this carbon. We found this carbon, which was coming from the land, now in the water, is a critical parameter. And this parameter is dominating the strength and the direction of the future carbon emissions from the ocean waters and the shelf region. Uh, now, there is not necessarily the nutrient supply, which is like going from the land to the waters. It's more the light plantation and the phytoplankton communities, which are um, influenced by this carbon. These two are the critical factors determining the oceans to be a carbon dioxide source in the future. In a nutshell, we found that uh, there's a lots of erosion and a lots of stuff going on in the Arctic. So these are hotspots of change. More river runoff and more carbon from thawed permafrost may turn the Arctic rivers, the initial zone and the ocean to a net greenhouse gas source in future. And this uh, permafrost degradation is affecting also people. Like they are living five million people, which are like built on, on permafrost, their cities and all the houses. And there's even more people living there when including the permafrost regions in the subarctic. With permafrost thaw and changing um, patterns in the ice, on the rivers, on the ocean, it's they have uh, disrupted access to herding, hunting, fishing grounds, and this calls, uh, also causes instability of agricultural land. For all the people living outside the region, there is a self-reinforcing feedback called the permafrost carbon feedback. More warming will cause more thaw, and this thaw will cause more uh, greenhouse gas release, which will cause more warming, and uh, so on and so forth. This means for us that every degree warming we can like not do here or wherever we live avoids any uh, can help to to keep as much carbon sequestered in the Arctic as possible. And this helps to reach not the critical tipping point. Taken together, what does everything we've heard mean for how we model ecosystem change in the Arctic and beyond? I'm Neil Bannis, an oceanographer and ecologist at the University of Strathclyde, right here in Glasgow, and I lead one of the teams in CAO that has been working on translating all these new discoveries from the field into improved computer simulations. Our goal is to bridge the gap between large-scale projections of ocean physics and chemistry on the one hand, and all the urgent questions we face about the future of commercial fisheries, traditional food and subsistence, and the conservation of whales and polar bears and seabirds. We've made a lot of progress in CAO in representing how organisms big and small depend on ice. This starts with models of how light is transmitted through all the different varieties of sea ice and better models of how the algae that live in the ice itself respond to that. The next level of model we're developing describes zooplankton, like these Callinus copepods, little crustaceans found everywhere in the Arctic at the heart of the food web. As Finlow explained earlier, zooplankton need algae for food, and so they need underwater light so the algae can grow, but they also need darkness for safety. And we're using models to understand how these conflicting needs play out as ice diminishes. These very small scale stories don't stay small scale. They've already started to reshape the map of where the ocean does and does not produce the right kind of plankton to feed fish. Other colleagues have been developing new ways to mathematically model how large predators like polar bears and seals use sea ice. This leads to models that can better connect the dots between climate change and our other management and policy choices. For example, how do we manage fishing in the future of Barents Sea? The key result from this full food web model project based here at Strathclyde is that we should be minimizing the harvest of plankton-eating fish like herring and capelin in order to protect the upper levels of the food web, like birds and mammals. This is a difficult policy trade-off, and more difficult trade-offs like it are coming to other regional seas. So the ecosystem models we're building are intended to provide specific long-range decision support. But another thing that models can help us do is think clearly across scales. One of the projects I was involved in as part of CAO was an effort to understand what Disco Bay in West Greenland means to the bowhead whales in that part of the world. Bowhead whales are the largest Arctic marine mammal 
and huge numbers of them come to Disco Bay in the spring from very far away in order to feed on Callinus copepods. What we discovered is that many of the copepods themselves have also come to Disco Bay from elsewhere with currents. These days, it's mainly copepods from the Atlantic, following these red pathways, not the Arctic as it would have been a few decades ago. And those same Atlantic copepods are the ones that, if they're carried in the other direction, support fisheries and seabird colonies off the coast of Ireland and Britain. And so these model-based maps are a way of reminding ourselves how literally all of these changing ecosystems are woven together at the base of the food web. But I bring up bowhead whales for another reason too, which is that they live for 200 years. And in the context of the decisions being made here at COP, I think that's a very poignant and challenging fact. It means that there are whales alive today who have been present for the entire arc from the age of industrial slaughter in the 1800s that nearly brought them to the point of extinction through the hard-won international agreements to protect them and now the current period of slow recovery. It, it also means, though, that there are whales alive today who will easily outlive the entire timeline in our model projections if we can protect the climate and ecosystems that they depend on. When we imagine the world that we are going to have in a year like 2140, at the end of the current crisis, we call it science fiction. But for the bowhead whales in the ocean today, it's just a kind of retirement planning. So I hope that as you go about your work here at COP, it helps to imagine the perspective on connection that the copepods would take, or the perspective on time that the bowhead whales would take if they could also be here. <laughs>